Welcome. I'm Eric Grimmelman. I'm the Executive Director of the New York Technology Council. Delighted to have you here tonight on this rainy evening. Uh, we've got a, a great program tonight. I'm sure we'll all learn a lot. And uh, as you've noticed, we're videoing it, so uh, you'll be able to go back and, and catch anything you missed or recommend it to someone who isn't here you might think might like it. Uh, I'll start by thanking our 2012 annual sponsors. Uh, for those of you uh, who haven't been here at one of our events in a couple of months, the list is about twice as long as it was a while back. I want particularly uh, thank our uh, patent sponsors, Eisner Amper, Power Space and Services, Ernst Young, and Google, and of course all of our other sponsors. Literally, we'd not be here without them. I uh, also want to mention our partner organizations, NITEC, uh, tries to be very collaborative. Well, we work with many other organizations. This list will be growing uh, uh, later this fall. Uh, and so we often uh, put on events with other organizations and it's just uh, those we currently work on. Also mention our media partners. Uh, three so far, more on the way. And a special thanks to Anshin for providing this uh, lovely space for us tonight. This is our first event in the ancient space, and uh, we're delighted to be here and look forward to coming back for future events. And now, uh, for the main event, uh, content marketing beyond liking and tweeting. And Ruben Quinones uh, is our speaker tonight, and I'd like to welcome, thank him in advance for his talk. Right. Thank you. So just to have a little bit of of insight into what I do and uh, what my company does and our exposure to content marketing. Uh, these are some of the brands that we deal with. We're, uh, Path Interactive is a, a small boutique agency, uh, digital marketing agency in the Flattered Iron District and we have uh, a number of these brands and uh, our exposure to content will come from not only these brands but we have a relationship with time and content solutions. So there are brands that we deal with that are, are of higher caliber that are not on the slide. Um, and what I hope to do tonight is to give you some insights into some of the approaches that we implement um, that go beyond just what we usually hear is, well, you have to get likes or you have to tweet this out to make stuff happen. Some, hopefully some tactics that you can look to employ whenever you're putting out content. Um, besides my full-time job, which there I'm client, client management, uh, account director role, I also teach at NYU a few digital courses, um, social media, Facebook marketing, and I co-instruct an SEO course. Uh, and then when I'm not doing that, I'm speaking at events. So basically, I don't sleep. <laughs> um, but I love what I do, and I get to do this every day. And I hope to share some uh, insight with you. So um, these are my fluff slides, right? Um, any smiles in the room? I'm trying to see if anybody watched this movie. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? When we think of... Uh, uh, when we think of content marketing, it, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it is the most conversion-friendly uh, uh, type of tactic out there. Um, there is no evidence to speak to that. Um, in, in fact, really what content marketing is, is, uh, is to build the familiarity of your brand, uh, the likability of your brand, uh, the credibility, and building trust within the community. The idea is to, when they're in the market, that you're one or two or three vendors that they think of because you've built this ongoing relationship over the last few years. And the way that you can do that is either in person, but now we live in a world where we can't even have a cup of coffee with someone. Everybody, I gotta leave them, uh, uh, someone's gotta leave me a voicemail that gets transcribed and emailed to me. I don't even listen to voicemail, right? Google Voice. Um, so it's tough to just have meetings. So a way to counteract that um, is to obviously put out content so that we're, in a subtle way, are, are, we're, we're staying on top of, we're staying on, we're, we're top of mind for our customers. Um, and I know that there's some brands and some, ag some agencies here that are looking to do this for their brands as well. Um, not only is this a building, a, 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 a credibility building tool, but it, it also happens to be um, a, a good SEO tool for us, right? So we do search engine optimization, and um, content is probably one of, our, one of our critical items that we use, or elements that we use when it comes to optimizing websites. Uh, so I don't know if any SEO marketers in the room, but um, Google in the last year, one of their algorithm changes was actually the freshness of a website. 
So if you're not putting out fresh content, Google's uh, can factoring or not factoring that into their search results. They're going to prefer a website that is providing fresh, active content as opposed to one that is static. So for us, that is a critical tool or an element to know when we're putting out content that it also helps us from an SEO perspective, search engine optimization. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about Google as well as social because honestly, I don't see the difference anymore. <laughs> it, to me, it's one of the same. You do a Google search result, what do you get? In some, most cases, you'll get LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, if it's a research-oriented phrase, you're going to get SlideShare and, and maybe Flickr images and videos from YouTube. So the search results in itself are actually very social. So it's very important to keep in mind that you're really optimizing for both channels. Excuse me. Yes. Um, can I just ask, will we be able to get a copy of the day? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, thanks for reminding me. So there's like 50 slides here. I was really trying to cut it down, but I tend to go heavy <laughs> because I really want to provide value. And yes, I, I will uh, let you know where to actually get this. I actually might be emailing it to you tonight. Um, so talking about Google and Facebook, so we are going to talk about other social sites, but it's no, it's important to note that these are the most, these are the most critical properties on the internet right now, as I view it, when it comes to content. Google, for the last decade or so, uh, is important because it indexes content. Now, you don't stay within that property. You go to Google, you do the search result, and all that it is is just spitting out search results for you. Uh, what has Google a big concern and why you see Google Plus and a big effort towards social is that it, it realizes Facebook, when you go to Facebook, you're staying within their own ecosystem. You are actually now spending the average is about an hour and a half a day. And as you know, now with mobile devices, we're staying on there all day without even really knowing. <laughs> so uh, Facebook has the, the ecosystem, if you will, or the, the attention, the the actual, the actual audience staying on their property. But what we've say, seen in the last few years is that now websites are actually starting to integrate Facebook. So you have the login, right? You go to CNN, you can log in. You can go to an e-commerce store, you can log in via Facebook. And content in itself has like buttons throughout the internet. So it's very interesting what's happening in the marketplace in that Facebook which it is, they've already announced that they're going to go after the search market, is actually has data on all these websites that have implemented the like button. So whenever you see the like button or the recommend button, they're actually collecting that data. So when it comes to content marketing, it's important to know that you're not just playing in this game, you're playing in this game as well. Okay. Um, because search is so important, it, it um, 10 years ago or a decade or so ago when Google came out into the marketplace, what differentiated them as a search engine, if you remember Alta Vista, Lycos, Hapa, Excite, remember those names? <laughs> Go.com. Takes you back a while. They all did the same way. They basically look at the code of your website and they index your page. Google came into the marketplace and decided that, no, we're going to factor in link backs to your website as a vote to say that this website is important. Not only because the website says it's important, but because the community says it's important. And the only way you can do that back then was by a link back. Except now you can actually measure the community responses to a piece of content, right? So what was link backs back then is actually people voting and liking and retweeting your content. So uh, in 2009, when this report was put out, this is SEO Miles, which basically takes, puts out a survey to the top SEO firms, search and optimization firms in the nation. And they actually come out with a report which tells us, percentage-wise, in our algorithm, how do we serve up or how do we factor in who comes up to the first page of Google? And this was at five point something percent. Two years later, went up two percentage points. And it's believed two years or a year from now, because this is 2011, that it's going to increase again. So if you're not including social elements in your content, realize that it is becoming a bigger and bigger piece of the pie when it comes to just serving you up on Google. Make sense? All right? Um, so some characteristics of 
uh, content that do really well, and then I go over some tactics. Considering now that I know I have to now optimize for Google and social, how do I uncover not only topics, but how do I know what keywords or what I can, what type of content I can create to really hit home and know that when I disseminate this piece of content, I'm giving it the best chance possible. So um, these are really characteristics of, of content that does, does really well on the web. Um, first is what's new, and I'll kind of breeze through this, you can reference this later. Commentary posts, when you're commenting on what's going on, um, what's going to happen, what to watch out for, how to proceed, how to's are big, especially if you have video content. You'll notice that whenever you do how to searches on Google, a good percentage of time you're going to get a video result. They love actually including videos in search results on Google if you have how-to videos. So if you're doing video marketing, that's important. Tools and resources that can be valuable to you. Uh, answering a question, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a few sites that you can go to. And people are actually asking questions. Well, that's a great idea for uh, a, a piece of content, right? Because there's some engagement and there's some questions around a content piece that you're about to produce. Um, and then common mistakes to look out for. I think we all like that, right? <laughs> I want to make sure I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not being sold down the river. So um, when we identify these, 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 um, these content pieces, I, we, we have to segment our customers. And so we have to know who our audience is. Um, we have to know who our customers and alliances. So uh, almost everyone in this room, you have different customer types. There might be one, two, or three. But we also have what are called alliances, right? So a commercial real estate broker is probably going to deal with a real estate attorney um, and, and possibly an accountant as well, right? It just makes sense in that industry that those are verticals that you usually deal with because they are strategic alliances. They are the two or three people that you refer business to each other or you, you speak a common language. Um, so that's what I mean when I, I reference alliances, that we have customer audiences and then we have alliances. And so we shouldn't just be writing for our customers, we should also keep our alliances in mind, right? These are the people that actually do and can refer us business or sustain our business over time. And you know, what are they truly asking? So the tactics that I'll go over today will help you unearth some of those questions that people are asking or at least some of the topics that are already being discussed. <clears throat> so, kind of what I mentioned already, customer segmentation and alliances. I want to know what are the different customer types and what are the different alliances. Um, when I do customer segmentation and I, I, I identify what key terms um, are critical for these, these customer types and audiences, basically these tactics that I'm going to show you are going to help you come up with topical ideas for your content. It's going to uncover blogs and sites that you didn't realize were basically writing about the piece of content that you were thinking of. So this is shifting from, I'm going to start writing about this content because this is what we're seeing from our research offline, right? Or we're doing customer surveys. This is just truly going online and digging and realizing, wow, there's some good opportunities because people are writing about this, number one, or are really responding to this. It, it makes for a good content piece. and then. When we figure out what phrases um, map back to these customer types, it helps us embed these key phrases, not only for optimizing um, a content piece, but also when we disseminate this into social sites, that it basically is, is basically mapping back to conversations that are already happening because they, are, they actually have those key phrases in it. So a scenario to kind of make this um, more tactical and give you an example. When I say touch points, context, and audience, this is what I'm talking about. These are key phrases, right? So touch point key phrases are basically phrases that I know are critical to that customer type or alliance. For example, um, cash flow, tax shelter, appreciation, those are touch points or those are actual key phrases that an accountant would use almost daily. I mean, th those are terms that really speak to that audience, right? And that's kind of what we have to do with our different customer types, is actually come up, what are those touch points, or what are those critical phrases that these customers use on a, on a, on a, on a daily basis, or strategic alliances. 
Second, is there any context-free, contextual phrases? Meaning, um, are, are there any phrases, you know, I have a client right now that's actually doing a conference in Atlanta. Um, so Atlanta would be a context for them, right? The name of the conference, conference would be contextual as well. So it's really what's happening around that industry that would help me put some context to some of these phrases. And then third, and but uh, last, is the audience. You know, what is the, the actual audience? Is it accountants? Is it you know, IT? That's an actual phrase in itself. So basically, I would go on Google, and I'll show you what I would do. But these are variations that I'm going to type in in a number of websites. So an example of brand name and context is me going to Google and typing in, OK, brand name is JetBlue. Context uh, would might be um, New York. And a touch point might be customer service. Wouldn't that be important for JetBlue, right? So there's three key phrases I was able to identify for JetBlue. And so I can write in a, a number of phrases. And you're probably wondering, well, what is this doing within the slide? <laughs> in that if you do a phrase and you don't actually get the result you were looking for, it's almost, um, you know, it's almost comparable to being a photographer. I don't know how many photographers are in the room, but if you actually handle a real camera, not your phone or <laughs> you know, another device, uh, actually when I got my first digital SR, I actually had to take a class, right? You have to learn about aperture and lighting, all this you know, camera photography stuff. Um, but you have to focus in and focus out with these phrases. You have to keep tweaking them until you really get the results that you want or you need. Um, because I'm going to take um, a variation of those phrases and I'm going to simply type it into Google. Right? I've done this for customer after customer, audience type after audience type, and when I tweak it enough, I start unearthing these results that I didn't realize are, are actually opportunities for me. So uh, a Boolean search are with the quotations, right? So what that means when I'm writing quotations is, um, and I put context and touch point, we can use JetBlue and customer service as an example, right? JetBlue and customer service, they don't have to be in the same article, JetBlue customer service, but JetBlue has to be somewhere in the article and customer service has to be somewhere else in the article. It doesn't have to be together. That's what I, when I, when I do Boolean searches, that's exactly what I'm telling Google. Now, I don't know if anybody uses this on the right-hand side. Anybody? Maybe images. Anybody use it for blogs? Blogs? Or news. So if you, use, if you do the Boolean search and you actually filter and actually you go and you click into blogs, you start seeing some interesting stuff. Because <laughs> now you're starting to uh, unearth some opportunity. or you're, you're unearthing uh, actual other content, people that are talking about those phrases and actually have a context and a touch point to it. Different than if you get news. If you get news, it's going to be the Wall Street Journal and some other media sources. We're trying to get to those, uh, those gems, those little gems. So if you do blogs, you're going to start um, looking at some opportunities. And what it's going to provide for you, you can do the same thing on YouTube, and you'll get a different set of results. You'll just get video content. You can do the same thing on Twitter and you'll get snippets of information just off of Twitter. You can do the same thing on a site called Social Mention, which aggregates the social web for you and will give you a different set of results as opposed to Google. Um, and then you can also um, do the same phrases. Anybody use LinkedIn answers here? Yes, we have to do a LinkedIn session. A few people, right? It is, it is one, of the, one of the hidden jewels in, on the social web. You can type in these phrases, and people are asking questions about these phrases. <laughs> so you go to LinkedIn, you click on answers, and almost any vertical will have some type of question and answer going on. But I can do the same thing. Anybody know Quora or another question and answer site? The same Boolean search I can put into Quora. So what, this, what does this allow me to do, these question and answer sites? First of all, if it's a thread that has 35 comments, isn't it worthy of a content piece, right? <laughs> right? Because obviously it's already getting some type of engagement on some of these question and answer sites. You know, how about if I actually wrote a content piece and then I actually left it on the actual thread, which I actually did on LinkedIn. I did a video commentary on a question. Believe it or not, I actually got business off of it. I wasn't looking for it. It was just for fun. So it, it allows you to match the content that you're creating to what people are asking on the internet. 
So as an example, you know, I think it might be worth just to do a, a live search. Probably you should use the mouse for this. So you get an idea of what I'm talking about, right? So um, this is Chrome, so just go to Google directly. And you know, I can say cash flow New York. Right? So my audience might be, you know, accounts, right? So I'm not saying this is your, your results. That's universal search. I'm actually saying, you know, filter it a little bit deeper and click on blogs, right? And again, what I'm getting now are, are actual results from uh, blogs that are talking about those two things, which, to, which, which would be, and what did I type in there? I typed in a touch point and context, right? New York is the context, it's geographic relevance, and cash flow is the, 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 uh, the actual touch point. I can do this for a number of keywords for this audience, audience type, right? I can now do touch point and maybe some other relevance if there's a conference. So you have to play around with these terms to get a full boat of, uh, of ideas to look at. So what this does is it provides me with content writing opportunities because people are already talking about it. But it also, if I click in here, um, you do have to dig a little bit and see what is the actual context of the blog post. But if this is a blog, um, and this is not the hottest subject, right? But if this happens to be a blog with some type of engagement, now I know that there's an opportunity for those actual two key phrases. Or there's an opportunity, as I'll talk about later on, to actually possibly approach these blogs to submit content to them as well, right? Because number one, you'd get more visibility. Number two, if you get a link back to your site, you're providing some SEO juice for your site as well. So we use that tactic to also um, uh, look for linking opportunities besides just content. Uh, so the steps should look like this, right? So I'm going to write them in steps. Identify touch points, identify any context to those critical key phrases, map it back to your different audiences, and incorporate it into your content calendar. I'm not sure, and again, and, and you know, I'm more of a digital marketer, SEO, social. Uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't part of content marketing prior to that. I'm not sure how calendars were made up, um, but to me, this is critical for me. I don't know how to make up a calendar if it's not really being, if I'm not validating that there's an opportunity online for this content calendar. So can quickly jump into, all right, when we're creating this content and we know what we're going to write about, you know, what are some of the on-site considerations as well as off-site? We'll talk about off-site, right? We're talking about search and social here. Um, because if I'm not doing it, if I'm not optimizing it on my website, then I'm not really, you know, optimizing it possibly for Google and possibly some search sites as well. Um, so does it speak to your audience? We kind of went over that. Is it optimized for Google? You know, that's another session as far as optimizing, but is it credible? I'm not going to put out anything that is, you know, not something that's, gonna, that's not going to provide some credibility to my organization. Is it relevant to my brand or services ultimately? And it, is it easily shareable? So an example is, you know, this is an extreme example because we're a digital agency. I am not saying to go and th start throwing social buttons on your navigation. Although I might make an argument for almost everybody in this room, no matter what vertical you're in, that LinkedIn should at least be one of your buttons, right? Um, and it is a case-by-case -case basis. So this is different from sharing. This is actual navigation to, hey, how do I communicate to your brand? And taking them off your site is not a bad thing. Taking them to another social party, that property that belongs to your brand is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, it's sometimes it's actually better. Because if they're actually engaging with your brand on a social property, it's probably a lot more mileage than you might actually get on site, <laughs> right? So you have to have that mind shift of thinking, it's got to go to my website. No, I, don't, you know, I, I really don't care if they engage with me on my website or Facebook or LinkedIn. At the end of the day, those are my properties. So we need to realize it's an extension of our brand, and these are now multiple web properties in a way. 
Um, but we make it very easy. Again, extreme example, not saying that most um, verticals have to do this. Um, and then the reoccurring portion of, re reoccurring content portion of our site, is it easily shareable? Uh, and if you don't want to call it a blog, you can call it a resource center. That's what I call it to <laughs> my clients who think, you know, blog is lowbrow. It's where we're going to continue to push out content, right? Uh, again, there's, there's enough evidence to speak to having a, a portion of your site that pushes out content consistently. Number one, it optimizes for Google, but also it provides a conversation piece for your social properties. So, um, you know, are we making it easiest for our, our customers to share by installing the like button, the tweet button, and LinkedIn, um, which now we have the plus one button, we, which we have to do as well. Um, Google authorship markup, anybody know about that here? Okay. So, if you've been on Google and you've typed in a research-oriented phrase, you may have seen pictures pop up, right? So Google rolled this out a few months ago, and this is almost like another social element we have to consider when it comes to um, making sure that we're optimizing our pages on our website with those social elements. Um, and when I put out this slide, I actually have a step-by-step. -step. We wrote a blog piece, which is linked here. It'll tell you how to implement it and everything about it. But essentially what it is is that you're authenticating your content to Google. Um, but not only that, what's happening is your, your pictures are showing up, right? And this, again, would be for your blog or your resource centers. You can't do this for the navigation, the home page. This would only be for like the blog or the resource center where you have multiple authors. So you're authenticating your content piece, but also part of Google's algorithm is they look at click-through rate, right? Click-through rate meaning, you know, how many people are clicking on the, this link versus this link? So a percentage of their algorithm actually factors in, is, are these guys getting more click-throughs than these guys? If so, we must consider that in how we serve up results. So a small percentage of their algorithm actually looks at what's clicked at the most. So it's putting a picture next to your search result actually will increase your click-through rate. And you can actually get a positive lift in click-through rates and actually uh, impact the algorithm. So it is a social element, but it also happens to be a search element as well. So we do have a, a, a walkthrough as far as how to implement it and what that is uh, in more detail. So this was my attempt about a year ago to try to categorize a social web, and I probably need to update it. Yeah, it's pretty daunting, but um, just looking at anything social is pretty daunting. This helps you at least try to categorize it. We're not going to talk about this all this today. And there's a few things that are, are missing here. Um, but it's not just Facebook and Twitter. And I'm not saying that your brand or the brands you represent have to be in all of these places. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but do we have a, 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 you know, are we constantly putting out press release? If so, are we taking advantage of press release sites? What's not on here are docu document sharing sites, right, which are SlideShare and DocStock, which I have a little bit. So you can reference that later on in the slides. But it's to give you a, an indication of really what our co content marketing opportunities are, not just Facebook and Twitter. Um, then you have content that is, is just for, that is social-based content. Um, we, we put together calendars for our, our clients' Facebook pages. It has nothing to do with what's on site because it's just a different audience and it's more social in nature. Um, <clears throat> so when we look to repurpose or have dedicated content, uh, we're basically looking, oh, well, what's lying around that we haven't really utilized? I mean, almost every client, you know, you know, a good percentage of them have PDFs lying around on their website that it would take, it would, you, you have to move heaven and earth just to get to it on the navigation of a website. It's just deep in there. Well, why don't we take those PDFs, all those PowerPoints, and actually repurpose it on a site like SlideShare, SlideShare right? Uh, where we can optimize it around these key phrases. Again, going back to touch point and those, those critical phrases that we would use to speak to our audiences, we're doing the same thing with uh, some of the, the content that we have existing already. I uh, had a commercial real estate client where he had a whole write-up with a lot of photos of all the different buildings and PDFs. We took that content and we made a PowerPoint. It was already there. We just repurposed it. So repurposing content is another opportunity. It's stuff that you have on your site, it's dormant, no one even gets there if you look at your Google Analytics, right? It just, 
you know, it's pretty tough to get there. You can take that and actually repurpose it in a way that will show up on Google and some other social sites in a different manner. Um, looking at possibly uh, hashtags on Twitter, are there little snippets of information that we can jump on? So an example, have a, a client doing a conference this week, as I mentioned, and so we're jumping on the hashtag and we're writing a content piece that matches up with that hashtag. So real quick, hashtags are just topics categorized on Twitter, right? Uh, Pinterest, everybody know Pinterest by now, right? Highly visual site. Are there photos lying around in our site that we're not repurposing or at least dedicating to a site like Pinterest, which has uh, the actual number one social ROI in the industry, Pinterest? Anybody know why? Because yeah. women shop. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, not, only, not only is it a photo sharing site, it also, also happens to be what's called a bookmarking site, right? So you can go around the web and bookmark all the little nice shoes that you like. You may not be able to buy it now, but you're going to reference it in a month and say, I like those shoes, now I'm ready to purchase it. That image points back to the website and ta-da, you have a transaction. So there's enough evidence out there that the images that you can repurpose from your site onto a site like Pinterest are well worth the effort. So this is a visual piece of content, not necessarily a text-based portion. So don't just think it has to be text-based. It's photos, it's PowerPoints, it's PDFs, multiple opportunities. Um, uh, I just want to make sure I'm doing okay with time because I have a lot of slides. Real quick, but uh, it's relevant. Quick. So for Pinterest, uh, say you're an e-commerce uh, platform and you have 75 different products, would you recommend basically creating a board and putting images of all of those products um, up at one time on your board for people to find? Kind of goes back to the identifying what the phrases are. And then I might be going a little bit too deep, but actually doing keyword research based on what's the search volume, what's the behavioral pattern on Google for these terms? Because usually if there's search volume on Google for it, then that's the same way, that's the same way they're going to actually perform the search on these other social sites. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we, I see the same pattern on social sites because for the last decade or so, we have a certain way of typing in our search terms on Google. Um, some other uh, content off-site opportunities, article sites that you can submit to, um, guest blogging on industry sites. Again, these are, are uh, blogs that you come across when you perform these searches. And then um, alliance sites that, you know, you have a strategic alliance with them, and why not do cross-promotion opportunities with them? And, you know, I write on your blog, you write in ours, and, and now you're strengthening not only the, the, the relationship with that alliance, but also you're, you're optimizing both of your websites as well at the same time. Let's talk a little bit about Facebook, right? Because it's not just content marketing on our, uh, on our site, but it's also on you know, the big gorilla in the room, right? Which is Facebook. Um, so everybody knows the homepage news feed, right? You go on there and, and whether we like it or not, <laughs> people are, almost a billion people are on it and are spending time, most of their time, actually on the news feed. So the news feed is when you first log in, right? This is what you see. And most people have, in the last few years, spent their money on the 10%, which is applications and tools. When in reality, 27% of the time that is actually spent within Facebook is on the news feed. Well, I call it the stock feed, right? <laughs> I want to know what all my friends and brands are doing, whatever the case may be. They stay on that homepage news feed. So now that's critical because when I'm putting together a message, I have to now make sure that I'm short, I'm succinct, succinct and I'm, and I'm uh, po right to the point. So I have to make an impact on that news feed, which is, by the way, why most the, the number one media type on Facebook is guess photos, actually. You would think it would be videos, but it's actually photos. So being highly visual on Facebook is critical. And not that you can't do videos, but those get the most engagement. The average fan page vo visibility. So you think you put out a piece of content that most people are seeing it? No. 17% are actually seeing your, your news, your, your actual post. So you have 5,000 likes. Well, you know, trying to figure out the math there. But only 17% will actually, out of the 5,000, will actually see your post. And that's because Facebook has their own algorithm. Anybody here of EdgeRank here? Okay. That is Facebook's algorithm. 
So now when we're marketing on Facebook, it's a, it's a different, it's a different uh, type of effort. We have to realize that there are, um, and it's almost like another session, is talking about the algorithm. But basically, if we're hitting on these three points, so we have to stand out. I thought that was a cute picture. To stand out, <laughs> we have to increase engagement. And realize that engagement is not just likes, tweet, you know, likes, shares, and comments. It's also consumption. Me just clicking on it. That's a critical component as well. So don't, don't be sad if you're not getting likes. <laughs> you know, it, it, it factors in some other stuff as well. Uh, we have to build affinity. So it's not just the brand, it's also the piece of content that I'm putting out and what my affinity is to just that one wall post. Again, warrants another session. Um, and then establishing frequency. If we're not establishing some type of frequency, then we're going to fall off. We're going to be part of that um, 12, 80 some odd percent that is not showing up. The 83 percent that is actually not seeing your wall post. So what's the biggest secret on Facebook? It's not the market. <laughs> you know, it is almost like selling without selling in a way. Um, you know, it, I'll be the first one to tell you, just like content marketing, it is not a tool where we're looking for direct conversions. Now, I have case studies where we've done pretty good as far as direct conversions based off some of the, some of the campaigns that we've done. But there's, again, not, evi not enough evidence to support uh, Facebook one being one of the, the top conversion tools out there. It is, it is first a relationship building tool. And it plays well when it comes to content because in essence, that's what it is. It's a relationship building tool. So don't mark it. Um, but what the ingredients that I have seen be successful on Facebook is if you have the right mix of these three ingredients, then you're giving your best shot. And I'm not saying just be educational. That's annoying as heck if you're just educational because everybody else is. You have to have the right mix and it depends on the industry and the brand. If you're a B2B company, you're probably going to be heavier on the education. It's going to be tough to be entertaining. But if you're educational, if you're entertaining and you're exclusive to that fan base, meaning you have just exclusives for people on your Facebook page, if you have the right mix of those three ingredients, I usually see it perform. You're giving it your best shot. Those are the three ingredients that I usually see do well when it comes to successful Facebook marketing campaigns. And that, is, that goes true for your content. Now, this is, what I'm about to tell you is, about, is, is counterintuitive to what you usually are going to hear. Um, you should, when you can, actually target or, or have less people see your post when possible. Because if you think about it, if, if Facebook is determining who is going to see your content based on engagement rate, the best way to increase your engagement rate is to be very targeted with your content. So um, right now, this is only available to 5,000 likes and up. It may have changed recently. But you can basically target now without running Facebook ads. You can target by gender, relationship status, educational status, age, location, and language. So if your content piece, social-based content piece, is, you know, if you're a photographer and you are writing about weddings and it's, fem it's slanted towards females, well, it would actually benefit you to target females that recently got engaged and maybe you're just in New York. Those are three criteria now that I'm putting into Facebook and it immediately, it'll, it'll decrease the amount of fans that will see that post, but my engagement rate will go up. And ultimately, if I'm not increasing that engagement rate, then no one's going to see my content. Um, so this is fairly new and as far as organic marketing and needs to be considered. Now, when you run Facebook ads, you have a lot more options. Yes? So that's, that's very much like uh, the old uh, niche market, right? You're going after uh, uh, subject matter specialization. Yeah. Those are the people that are, are really engaged in, the, in whatever you're putting yeah. out there for them. So, uh, and I, anybody run Facebook ads here? Okay, so a few people. So, um, and would love to do a session on that, and I usually will usually speak at digital conferences about Facebook marketing. With ads, you can get as targeted as where they work, <laughs> where they work, what state, etc. So, uh, and I actually have a slide that you know I had, did for fun, where I was very targeted in who I, you know, I disseminated to. So it almost is counterintuitive because you're saying I want less fans to see this only because I want my engagement rate to go up. 
Um, so this is a, an actual client that I, 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 I actually ran a diagnosis for. And this was from Facebook Insights. Those who run Facebook ads, you're probably familiar with Insights. And I created this pie chart. And it's the same thing that you would do in a content calendar. I basically, um, now they didn't necessarily have a Facebook strategy. I went in there and said, all right, you seem to be posting about engagement. You know, you have engagement questions. You have a lot of testimonials. You have anything that's promotional where you're saying something about your business would be promotional. I also said, these are your entertainment posts. You know, you're putting photos out there. These are your actual blog posts. And then, you know, they, they uh, so tough challenge to, to market this brand. They do uh, a cost sharing service for an alternative to health insurance. You know, but becoming a case, uh, case study very, very quickly for me, right? So it's a, this is not Starbucks, <laughs> basically, right? So we had that challenge of how do we increase the engagement rate on a brand like this, slanted towards a Christian audience <laughs> to make it even more targeted. Um, so we also took a look at engagement rate, the actual clicks off of the news feed for these different content themes. So I went in there and I mapped out all their content themes based on what I saw. Um, so it, what it basically gave me was, all right, well, these are performing the least. So just keep that in mind. You might want to cut down on the frequency because you're not getting as many clicks. Um, but these, be, these are performing pretty good. This, here's an opportunity to actually increase the engagement on this. Um, a quick story on this. They used to have this in text version. We are not do, we're now putting the Bible verses in photos, and they've tripled their engagement rate just by making that change. Yes? Are you saying that the verse is a photo and you can't see the verse until you click on it? Basically, basically it was just a status update before I got involved. Yet it was still one of their highest click-through rates on the newsfeed, and I basically went in there. I see here. I see an opportunity here. We took the vo photo. Uh, we took the verses, put them in a photo, and now they stand out in the newsfeed as a photo with a Bible verse in it. So instead of a text version, it's a photo now. And as you can tell, when you see newsfeed, you know photos just stand out a lot more. And then now, recently, we actually implemented the brand name in those photos. So if it's getting 70 shares a day, now the brand name is on it. So it's uh, something that I'm working on as far as putting together a case study because we just got involved. Um, but you can do this for a Facebook page, is look into insights and see who's getting consumption now. And these are, again, this is content, at the, but it's just dedicated to Facebook. Um, social ads is, is becoming more critical because Facebook needs to make money, right? <laughs> so if Google's making $36 billion a year, anybody know how much Facebook make, made last year? $3.6 billion at the end of the last year. 10% of what Google has made, which is why probably why they're going after the search market, right? So um, they're going to, I don't want to say favor, you know, but, but it certainly will increase your engagement rate to run ads. Um, but I, I have some examples. So I wrote a piece on how I thought Don Draper would use social media, right? Anybody a Mad Men fan here, right? Yeah, if we're marketing, we have to. So I, I, I did it for fun. I probably threw 30 bucks into this, literally. <laughs> so I said, all right, this is a piece of content on our website. And I advertised it on Facebook only to people that have an expressed interest for the show or Don Draper himself which means they've liked or they've uh, actually discussed Mad Men at some point in their Facebook experience. Um, and they also had to be social media marketers. I think I put that as a criteria. Um, so as you can see, you know, 20, 30 bucks got me 62 likes. Imagine I have a real budget, right? Um, so now it's taking your content and being um, a lot, taking it to another level because Facebook ads for the most part when you see them online are really tied back into sales <laughs> or applications. They're trying to get you to like a page. And I think there's a huge opportunity, because I don't see it happening often, for your content to just get more visibility. Because what I can't do on Google, I can do on Facebook. On Google, I just don't know who's typing in those search terms. I can guess. I know they're in the market, but I don't know who it is. On Facebook, it's the opposite, right? They may not be in the market, but I know who it is, based on the demographics. Um, but you just don't know when they're in the market. So an example would be, you know, a dentist in Manhattan on Google, they're in the market for a dentist. <laughs> I can't get that intelligence on Facebook. 
but I can get you know males and females between this age, you know, that live in Manhattan, as an example. So we might want to run a teeth whitening off, or maybe maybe they'll bite on it. So there's the big difference there, right? Is that I knew I know the who versus the when, if you will. So it'll be interesting if you know five years who's going to win the who and when show, right? Because Google is certainly going after that piece. Uh, on Google, I had mentioned this conference that was coming up. I did the reverse. It's you know I use immediately they came to me with less than a week, and I said, all right, well I'll try my best. Um, I assumed, and I wrote a, a piece of content basically talking about some things that we were doing at the conference, some other ideas that we were implementing, as well as our involvement in that conference they're exhibiting. So we wrote up the piece of content real quickly, and I'm like, how am I going to get this to that audience, the attendees that are going to be there? Other than tweeting about it, that's not really going to help. It's a new Twitter account, <laughs> right? So I, I had that challenge. Uh, so on Facebook, we actually marketed it to people that actually like the Catalyst Conference. On Google, I figured if people are going to the conference, they might Google the conference name, right? They might, hey, I just want to check the location or, you know, what the actual town is, what, what to do around there, what the program is. And it's been up for two days and we've gotten like 30 clicks on it. Um, could be getting more, except that Google is not giving us enough impressions because we're not the actual brand name. But uh, as much as we can, we're coming up with our blog posts, which is a content piece, marketing to attendees before they even show up. And I guarantee you they're probably the only exhibitor that actually is getting being in front of mind prior to the actual conference, other, other than people that are using their, you know, their database and paying for email marketing. Um, does that make sense? So I use Google for uh, search intent. Is that, was that the SEO or SEO? Uh, pay, yeah, pay. That's the, so that's a quick way to market, right? I, they didn't give me much time. I couldn't optimize it. You know, I could only optimize it to a certain extent. And it was a brand name. So, and these clicks are a lot cheaper, right? Because, as you can see, I have no competition. <laughs> it's one ad running, you know, probably 50 cents a click. And I'm getting it up there. And immediately, I'm, I'm getting people that are engaging with us on that blog post. Um, so when I think of what is my typical process or one of the, the, the processes that we have in-house, you know, I want to, what type of post am I going to write for this audience? Or who is my specific audience for this post that I'm writing? You know, what are the one or two critical phrases or critical points that I can answer for them? There has to be a purpose in me actually writing. Uh, and what are those two keywords that describe those critical points, right? So is it a touch point? Is there context to it? Is there a brand name that I can type in? Is there a competitive brand name? And see how much they're uh, actually talking about those critical phrases. Do those Boolean searches and see if it might spark up some ideas or at least provide you with some opportunities of blogs that are getting engagement off that contest, content piece. And can I stretch this into a series? That's like, I don't see that enough. <laughs> if I'm getting good engagement off of one content piece, why not go with part two, part three, part four? So I do a video on my own, and I'm in the B2B world, so I'm ecstatic when I get 100 views. And I get it all the time, I'm like, oh, I saw your video, I saw your video, I saw your video. Customers or potential clients. And usually if I have a really good content piece, I have a rule. I can't go beyond five minutes. If I go beyond five minutes, it's another content piece. <laughs> so now I'm able to optimize more around those phrases that I'm trying to go after, right? So it's not just one shot. Uh, now I have two three-minute videos after the same phrases that I'm going after. So when you measure up and when you look at metrics, um, please do not compare yourself to the Old Spice campaign or to Starbucks, right? These are the giants in the industry. And the reason why we do this is because we really have no reference. <laughs> now, there aren't that many agencies putting out information what it's like for a B2B marketer in New York City. Right, so you really, for the most part, I can give you a few case studies, but you are your really, you're really your own case study or your reference point. And I will give you some KPIs to look at when you look at measuring your content. It's a little bit tough because you're not really looking for a conversion necessarily. So, you know, on-site metrics and social metrics, passive and hard, right? What are your passive metrics and what are those hard metrics I can look at when I look at measuring my content? So Google Analytics, right? How many Google Analytics? So Google Analytics is just a tracking software that you install for your websites. It's used by many websites out there. And it gives you uh, 
data or traffic data based on the key terms people are using to come to your site or referring traffic, etc. Um, so number one, if I'm putting out content, are there new visitors coming to my site? And I would filter it by, by blogs for those that aren't Google Analytics. That's one reference point. That's a passive metric, right? Another passive metric will be, you know, uh, from the content that I'm creating, as far as referring traffic, what am I getting off of Facebook and LinkedIn and Quora? Again, it, more technical, I would filter it by the content section of your website, blogs. Um, passive again, are people clicking in deeper if they read the content piece? Did I pique their interest enough that they're actually navigating deeper into the page? Is it going from one to two or three? Then I know that I did a good job on that content piece, passive metric. Um, the duration of that visit. If I spend, you know, if, if before I install the blog, if your average um, you know, duration rate was 30 seconds, which could be the case if you don't have content to engage them, um, I would like to see that number go, come, go up once I introduce content. So you're again measuring against yourself and you can basically do it by post as well. So you can even do it by content themes. What different content themes are actually leading to uh, an average duration visit of over two minutes? they're spending two minutes on your page, they're reading your blog, <laughs> they're reading your content piece. If it's 30 seconds, we're not hitting home. Um, another, uh, or a hard metric is obviously goal. So on Google Analytics, you can actually, and this is usually not a typical metric that I would say that's your ultimate metric, but if you're looking for hard metrics, you can um, implement what's called um, goals, right, on, on Google Analytics. That basically says, someone filled out a form or someone clicked on a PDF download, right? That's a harder metric because they took an action as opposed to just visiting your page. So these are on-site metrics. How about some off-site metrics, right? Some social metrics. Impressions really tied into paid advertising, but then there's views, there's clicks, then there's consumption. And this is usually, you know, again, this is a, a, an actual passive metric. This is actually huge on Facebook that consumption rate is critical because most people don't actually share and I know it seems like most people do, but there are a lot of you know, people that just go on there and, and you know, don't actually actively engage. Yet they're, they are clicking on your content and they're consuming it. So that's still a passive metric that is still critical when it comes to measuring my content on a, on a site like Facebook or maybe some other sites. Um, YouTube also gives you this information. Um, some other metrics, you know, factoring into engagement rate, and these are harder metrics, right, or hard metrics. Likes, follows, connections, shares, retweets, and comments. Um, and then for the, the digital experts in the room, I try to dig a little bit deeper and say, okay, this seems easy for you, all right, you know, let's take it a little bit deeper. Brand mentions, which is easy. Share a voice by platform. Influencer penetration rate, <laughs> right, um, basically, People that I've um, deemed as influential to or potential influencers for my brand, meaning out of all the people that I see on Twitter that might have um, influence on my audience, you know, who are the people that actually have engagement, have the most follower count, not the same follower to following ratio, <laughs> someone that truly has engagement. Um, you know, what's my penetration rate with engaging with those influencers? Um, probably another session in itself. What's my brand association with targeted key phrases? Out of the key phrases that I chose, is my brand coming up 1% of the time out of all the conversations that are happening around the web when it comes to cash flow in New York, right? So going back to that example, cash flow in New York, is my brand mentioned 1% of the time, 2% of the time? I'd like to see that increase over time, the more content that I actually write about those two phrases. Make sense? Um, so those, again, those are deeper metrics. What my brand versus competitive, along with targeted key terms. So cash flow in New York, me versus my competition. <laughs> I'm getting 1% of the share of voice, they're getting 2%. You know, they're, they're basically my measurement or my benchmark, if you will. Any questions on metrics? Make sense? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, how would you ascertain these metrics? Um, so it probably goes into uh, this slide. <laughs> which I'll get to that in a second. So the deeper metric, right? So it's some Facebook ones, it's top level. 
So I can look at unique v viewers of my individual posts, people who have clicked. This is critical, and it is factored into their algorithm. So just because they're not liking it doesn't mean that your content piece is not doing its job. If they're clicking into it or they're consuming it in any way, it's still something that needs to be factored in. So it's still a win when it comes to your content on Facebook. Um, unique viewers who actually took an action. And again, this is those who manage Facebook pages are more familiar with this. So they, in, they, they now came out with their own analytical tool, which is not exactly like Google's, but it's certainly something that is a lot more impressive than, than what they used to have about a year or two ago. Um, and then lastly, they, they have this thing, if you hear talking about this at all, that's a Facebook metric. In the last seven days, how many people are actually talking about my brand? Meaning, how many people liked it, shared it, um, commented on any of my content in the last seven days? Okay. So. I have one other question, actually. Sure. So I've noticed that both on my site and uh, on your analytics, they're not providing yeah, you love that. <laughs> so that is becoming a challenge for marketers, right? So not provided is, um, you used to be able to see all the different keywords people use to come into your website. Now there's this, your top referring keyword coming into your website is called not provided in parentheses. And that's basically people that are opting out to share that information. So there's a crackdown, obviously, with privacy in general, um, a lot of searches. So when they set up their Google accounts, they're basically saying, no, I don't want to be, that to be recorded. So we are, you know, as marketers, we're, it's killing us because now we have to take a look at the little keyword level data that we have and using those as assumptions in a way. So that's what that is. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so some, not all the tools in the world, but what am I going to use when it comes to, hey, I picked up two key phrases that I see that are getting engagement. If I want to take this to a deeper level, I can use Google's external tools. So when I teach the SEO course at NYU, we do an exercise on Google AdWords. That's the external tool, which again, you'll have a copy of the slide. You basically now can look at what is the search volume for these key phrases if I type it into these tools. It'll give you an idea. And for the advanced ones, you want to do exact, not broad or phrase. Any AdWords? Okay. Another session. <laughs> SimilarSites.com. Anybody hear that? So if you come across a site that really, you know, is doing a good job as far as engagement and content, and possibly by, might be a site that you might want to engage with and actually offer up some content, remember, when it comes to content marketing, if if it might do better on someone else's site, that's okay, it's a win, right? Because there are several benefits to that. One being that your content actually is being seen, <laughs> right? If you don't have a lot of uh, engagement on your site. But this tool will allow you and give you similar sites. You type in the site, it'll give you 10 other similar sites that are writing about this content piece, right? SimilarSites.com. So anybody uses Google Chrome, they have a plugin as well, uh, extension. Google Trends, which is Google Insights and Trends, you can basically look at the trends of certain keywords. Is there any seasonality to it? Should I factor this into my content calendar, the seasonality of these actual key terms? Google Analytics, which I mentioned, you know, if you don't have that on your site, I'm not sure how you're going to be able to measure this as far as on-site. Uh, and then Salesforce Marketing Cloud, which is basically what brought out Radiant 6, is what we use. And that's how I'm able to get those deeper metrics. There are other um, tools out there and I say those tools are only as good as the marketer using them for the most part and that um, you know it gives you some great data but you got to be able to know how to play with those those tools but that's how I'm able to get those deeper metrics across the social web for the most part okay so you know I'm gonna give you this presentation well you can immediately get it if you go to facebook.com slash path interactus and you like us <laughs> we'll give you instant access to this, um, which is another thing, which is probably something you can actually put under your hat. Whenever I do a presentation, I actually usually put it on Facebook and I get a like out of it. So now I'm monetizing my content in a way, and usually I do it after a conference. I'm trying to build the credibility of the relationship and the people that I've met at, at the conference. And if you feel that there is, is any value in the presentation, um, you can come in and to our Facebook page and actually view it there and like us. <laughs> Um, just any questions in general? I know I kind of I jammed in a lot, um, but you'll be able to reference it. Yes? There's any like, great places you look for influencers. I mean, some of the things 
I spend a lot of time on, on this stuff. And uh, you know, all the sites like Cloud or things like that, they don't take into account everything. Oh, yeah. And they drop, you know, like no Facebook pages. So no Pinterest, none, you know, sorry, they don't have an API. Is there a, a place where you go for influence or you have to hit them all and just basically win? We, you, we might hit them all, but that, that Google search filter is great for yeah. finding influencers. Um, but let's say, I'm going back to the conference because it's top of mind, I'm spending all these hours on it, right? So another thing that I did for this conference was, was I looked at hashtags, right? I looked at their hashtag and they're a young crowd there and, and I know that they're going to be tweeting a lot. So I, I want them to know, how can I engage with those, people, those individuals? in a way that I'm not selling myself too much, but I'm jumping on there and actually, oh, I'm sorry. I actually created um, a spreadsheet. I'm gonna have to change my password, I guess, huh? <laughs> I, uh, I, I created a spreadsheet. I basically said, this is exactly what I had someone do today. I went on here and I, I'm, I'm noticing you know, all these individuals tweeting. And again, it de depends on who it is and the platform. This just happens to be a platform that I'm able to take advantage of. So we are two days away from the conference, and we have, <laughs> you would think they're already having their conference, right? Mm -hmm. So this hashtag, which is Catalyst. So I basically had someone create a spreadsheet. For, first of what I did was actually, I did Catalyst into Google, Catalyst Conference. And I had her filter all the blogs and create a spreadsheet of all those blogs and if they had Twitter handles next to them. And then what are their follower accounts as well as following? Because if they manipulated that, I, I'm not going to go after them. Mm -hmm. So they had to have a good follower to following ratio. Um, and what I basically did was like, what can we do? We're going to do some iPad giveaways at the conference. But what can we do to get them to our booth during the conference? And I said, you know what? I told my client, get 20 Starbucks certificate. Tomorrow we'll go and tweet out to these 20 individuals and say, drop by our booth, we have a small treat for you. Okay. We're not even at the, I'm not at the conference. They're not even at the conference yet. Yet we picked 20 influencers out of, I think 50, we did a spreadsheet of 50 people, bloggers, people that, I also put how many times they were tweeting a day. Mm -hmm as another factor. So you can basically map up what are the different criteria that are important to me as far as identifying an influencer. So that's a, that's a case by case basis, but this is just a real world example of how I approached a conference and how I basically created an influencer list. That was manual work. There's no tool that can do that for you, um, but I will tell you that I'm going to get the top 20 people there mm -hmm. to my booth. And I'm going to hope they're going to tweet it out because they're influential already. I already vetted that out for them. The client has no idea what the heck I'm doing, but um, I'm giving them the best chance possible to get some virality out of it. So I don't know how I'm doing with time. Just cut me off if you need to, but go ahead. <laughs> going back to the um, secret to Facebook not marketing, you talked about kind of targeting who you're going after, the niche marketing. Can you drive those at the same time? Like share your thoughts with going for a, a mass appeal or going for a critical mass as well as being very targeted at the same time. So you can boost your engagement, but then you do have a, a wider reach per se. Um, well, you can run multiple posts as well. You can do four or five posts to different targeted types. It takes more time, of course. So you can still do those wide, engaging posts. I'm not saying totally abandon that. But when you can, if you have the resources and the time, be dedicated to those different targeted types. Um, I didn't talk about acquisition versus nurture-based marketing on Facebook. But when you're running a campaign or a contest, I'm a big believer that whatever you're running and that better, it better not be an iPad giveaway. Please stop doing those. <laughs> you know, it's got to be, there has to be the right relevance to that. But, you know, I would say, I would use the example, if I'm a restaurant owner, I'm not going to invite a whole bunch of homeless people to my restaurant. No offense. But what is the probability that they're going to do business with me again? Probably very low. So it's the same approach when, I come to, when it comes to marketing on Facebook. The people that I'm going to spend money or put efforts towards in acquiring Again, I'm doing a contest to acquire new likes and you know uh, fans. 
they have to be very, they have to, it has to be, have some relevance to my brand. It has to be relevant to the audiences that I'm trying to attract in the first place. So that I might broadly target that, but at the same time I'm keeping in mind that they have to have some type of interest into what I might have to offer down the road. Other, otherwise, why, you know, then I'm getting into the like game, right? And I think we're getting into like fatigue. Everybody likes everybody in their mother, mother's business <laughs> now. So it's better to be targeted. And just two, one, just two quick follow-up questions. If you're using social media for your personal brand versus client-based, what's the mix between honestly just organically using social media for personal purposes versus strategically? Depends on the company. Yeah, it's tough for me to give a broad answer to that because you know, it, there's so many factors that go into it. Maybe we could talk offline on okay. your individual situation, but I don't want to give a broad answer to that because it totally depends. Okay. But it's a valid question. Any, anything else? Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, connecting uh, brands with um, content sources and you know, brand not necessarily in the uh, business of writing content or writing creative? Um, is there good ways you can yeah, there's some there's some content sources out there, but again, I wouldn't caught up get caught up in the text. Bit. Depends if it's on site versus social based content, and also I probably would do a quick analysis of, you know, if I type in these search terms, these key phrases, how relevant are those search results? Meaning, is my competition outwriting me now? Or are they writing more? So. Maybe I don't need as much content as I think I need, <laughs> right? So you have to do a quick overview of, is it a necessity to write four, five, six times a month? Maybe not in that industry. And the only way you can find out is if you do a Google search on those phrases. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's certainly, you know, brand does content marketing. You know, you can pay for, you know, custom writer, uh, writers that write specifically for your, um, your brand. Um, but you know, it's a case by case basis as well. <coughs> yeah. Um, so I have another question. So, say you're like a small business owner and you have a career company, a Facebook account, which is on your personal name. Right. Um, do you think there should be a clear separation where you would have a separate account just for your business, or would you use your, your own personal account, a Facebook account, to also uh, talk about your business terms? Um, sure. And just to quickly answer your follow-up, we actually do write content as well. Just a little plug. Um, it is a case-by-case -case basis with that as well, but it, I think it's also a resource question. Could you really manage two or three accounts? Um, I will say on Twitter, and, and you know, I probably need more evidence to support this, but you know, there's better engagement rates with personal, bra uh, personal brands because people just, for whatever reason, they're just little snippets of information and there's just a better following for personal brands as opposed to, you know, you know, business brands. On Twitter, Facebook could be the same thing, but there's more of a case to have a Facebook page because there's enough of an audience, if you will. Yeah, but then um, you're kind of mixing your sort of personal content with business yeah. and that could be problematic, Facebook. It also is how you want to be portrayed as a personal brand. So I keep it separate, you know. I have a, I mean, you know, I, I'll tweet sometimes under the company, but I don't, you know, I have my own separate because I don't want, you know, to s say something that may not be aligned with my brand. Not that I'm saying anything risque, but, you know, I, I, you know, and I'm a digital marketer too. That's different, so I'm going to use it a lot more. So the resource thing is not an issue because I don't sleep, <laughs> right? So it is a resource versus how you want to be portrayed as a personal brand, and you know, if you're going to have the, the, the you can have the time to manage both, and it depends on what you do too. I, I, I hate to throw out the, the it depends card, but for a lot of this stuff, oh. it does depend. <laughs> I don't want to give uh, too broad of an answer. Yes. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the future of uh, social news sites. I know you, I saw on your map there, but uh, Big's basically gone. It's gone. Yep. Yep. But, Stumble uh, Pond's not though. <laughs> I mean, what about Reddit and stuff like that? I think it's weird. You can't yeah. really measure that. Um, Some people get a few votes, but you're your click through be through the roof. So um, there's a, there's a, there's several ways to get your content out there. First of all, if you're not an influencer there, you're not going to get much. What I'm saying is getting some type of activity there does help those social indicators to Google to know that it's somewhere on the radar, especially for like a very 
specific phrase, right? So if people are typing in a certain search term, you know, they're only going to yield results based on that search term. So if that article has that key phrase in it and there's not that much competition for it, that's really all they can, you know, actually index. It doesn't matter if it's not popular on Reddit, it's still getting some type of indications. Now, you can use a dig or a Reddit to go after influencers and build relationships with them um, and actually hopefully down the road um, actually get some, you know, juice from them. So there is the influencer portion that you don't totally want to neglect because if you are putting out consistent content and you do start to build a relationship with some of those influencers, then there's something there. I mean, even Yelp, geez, Yelp is the news of <laughs> There's, you know, there are people that are Yelp influencers and they can shut your restaurant down in New York. That's how influential they are. So there are a lot of these different sites that just have influencers. I'm certainly not one of them, but you can easily do a search by category, even on a dig or some of these social sites. And now you're not subject to what's the most popular thing on Reddit. What is the most popular thing when it comes to that category? Make sense? So I had a piece of content that was just about Yankee Stadium years ago, and it was on the front page, I think, of the New York Times, because they actually dug, they used dig results in there. Because that was what my was that's what I was reading. I was reading about Yankee Stadium. So think about it, if it's very specific, you're not competing against the first page of Stumble Upon or Reddit. All right, we can't all be you know doing Gangnam Style here <laughs> for our brand. So that is different. Anybody know Gangnam Style? You guys don't know? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, because I didn't see a response. That's like really hot. Um, but that's really not what we're writing about. I'm not trying to go after, you know, size audience <laughs> or Gangnam Style's audience. I'm trying to get people to uh, um, um, notice my content that is very specific to those key phrases. Again, it goes back to doing these key phrase searches and, un you know, unearthing those opportunities. So is it easy? No, I'm not saying it is. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question or, okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you once again. I appreciate it. It's definitely a privilege. And, uh